All right, we are in Hebrews chapter 12 this morning, and uh, we are going to be wrapping up Hebrews probably about the end of November, and we'll get into a Christmas series then, but, but today we're still there, and we are down to Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to take a couple verses we wrapped up with last week and, and put them in today because they're part of the same paragraph. It says, therefore, this is verse 12 of chapter 12, therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone, and for a holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Let's say a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word because it speaks to us and it gives us life. And Lord, we're in a world of craziness and, and all around us, darkness surrounds us. And Lord, there is just so many that are just under a sentence of death, but the sentence that you have pronounced over your people is life. And so, Father, I pray for the life of your word to just shine through everything that's said today. May your spirit speak to us in a special way, and may we not just hear it and lose it, but may we take it into our hearts and become more the people you want us to be. In your name, Jesus, amen. Well, I, uh, this week, have been looking at this little paragraph of Scripture, and I've been trying to figure out how we get into this, this paragraph of Scripture. And I, I, I always sit down and I, I kind of write out, think out some ways that we can kind of jump into it. And so I did that twice. I didn't like either one of them. I'm sitting there and I'm looking at this and I'm praying about it. And I don't think this was from the Holy Spirit, but I thought about Colombo. How many of y'all remember Colombo? Not Columbia, the country, but Colombo, for those of you born after was a television detective back in the 70s, I think, maybe a little into the 80s. And he was this kind of sloppy guy. He had this old, like, overcoat, trench coat that he'd wear, and he'd solve these mysteries. But, but the unique thing about the Columbo show was that they always showed you at the beginning who the villain was. So you saw him commit the crime, and the whole thing was trying to figure out you know, how he's going to be able to solve it and prove that this is the guy. And so it started with the end. And I thought, you know what? We need to do a Columbo sermon, and we need to start with the end so we can understand the rest of, of what this is saying. And so the end of this is talking about Esau. So we're going we're gonna to go Columbo here, and we're going to talk about Esau. And most of us probably are familiar with him. We know that, that he was a twin and that he had a brother that was named Jacob, and that when the twins were born, Esau was born first, which was a pretty sweet place to be back in Old Testament days, because back then, if you were the firstborn, you basically got everything in the inheritance. You got to be kind of the leader of the clan. You were raised with that understanding. All the wealth would be coming to you. And, and his parents, Isaac and Rebecca, were very wealthy. And so there was a lot of money, a lot of finances that were coming his way. And so Esau, Esau had it made. It was, it was going to be good. And even beyond that, though, Esau wasn't one of those kind of, you know, wealthy or soon-to-be wealthy trust fund people that you wouldn't like. I, I think that if we met Esau, we would like him. And the more I was looking at Esau's life and thought about Esau this week, the more I realized Esau would have been an Ocala kind of guy. He was a hunter. He liked being outside. He loved his daddy. And they were very close together. And, and, and I just kind of extrapolated some things. Don't look for this in the Bible. But, but I started thinking the kind of guy, based on that, what Esau would have been like. And I think we really would have liked him. I, I think Esau would have loved sports. I think he would have been a Gator fan, at least until that, that interception festival yesterday. 
called the Florida LSU game that I don't even want to talk anymore about. So I'm, we're going to we're focusing on the Lord here. But I believe you've been a Gator fan. I believe that I, I believe you probably have driven a really really cool Jeep or pickup truck. I couldn't decide on which one it would be. I, I believe that that Esau's the kind of guy that if you were sick. You would, you would hear somebody outside cutting your grass, and it probably would have been Esau. I think if it was raining and you were trying to change your tire, Esau would have been over there in the rain helping you out. I believe that that's the kind of guy he was. He was a pretty good guy. Although we do find out in the Old Testament, he kind of had this thing for wild women. And uh, it got him into, into some trouble and caused his parents some grief, and we, we won't get into that part of him. But I, if, if we had to decide if we wanted Esau or Jacob to be our next-door neighbor, we would pick Esau in a second because he would be fun to talk to. He'd probably be good with some jokes. Jacob, from what we know, may have put a fence up two feet over on your property line. And there wouldn't be much you could do about it. So we would, we would pick Esau, and so it, it's kind of surprising that is, as we're reading this passage this morning, and we're looking, and Esau's name comes up, we, we see that it says to not be like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. And what we have here is kind of a going back to a story that's found in Genesis about Esau and Jacob, and it's talking about a time that Esau, he'd been outside, he'd been hunting, he'd spent the day out, and, and maybe been working around a little bit, and he was hungry. And he got home, and he, was, he realized he was really, really hungry. And his brother, remember those, those commercials they had for Eggo waffles? The Eggo would pop up in the toaster, and somebody would grab it, and they go, hey, let go of my Eggo. Well, it just so happened Jacob had made dinner, and Esau's there to grab it. He's like, hey, let go of my dinner. That's mine. I made that. And, and Esau says, I got to have that. I'm going to die. He's, I think Esau probably, we could add, he was maybe a little overly dramatic. And I, I got to have that. I'm, I'm going to die. If I don't eat right now, I'm going to start to eat. And Jacob says, back to the fence, two feet over on your property line kind of guy. Jacob says, well, what would you trade me for it? I just, I just got to have it. Well, why don't you give me your birthright, that right of being the firstborn son? If you give me that, I'll give you the meal. What? We'd say, huh? Esau says, well, if I starve to death, it's not going to serve me any good anyway. Okay, you can have it. Now give me the dinner. Now, we have this term that's been invented called hangry. You know hangry, what it means? Hungry and angry. But Esau gives us a new term that's not being used yet, but it needs to be dumbgree. Dumb and hungry together, dumbgree. And, and he does this, and, and he makes this tremendous blunder. And, and this blunder is based on this. It was to care about the immediate and not the long term. And see, this is where a lot of people... In our world are today, and let's say where a lot of people mess up in their Christian lives. They, they get so focused on what they can have right now. I got I to gotta get by, and so they just focus on getting by. Or, or I want my pleasure. I want to I do this thing that's going to feel good. That means more than, than everything else that's around them, that's further out, things that they've worked for, things that they've built. They got to have this immediate thing, this immediate gratification. And see, this was Esau. This was the blunder of Esau. And the passage says that he couldn't repent, though he, he tried to. And what this is telling us is there was a time after all this that he goes to Jacob and he says, you know, hey, we were just joking about that, that birthright thing, right? Ha, ha, ha. Jacob says, what do you mean joking? I wasn't joking. And so Esau, the Bible tells us here, was filled with regret, and, and he begged for it back. And it says, though he, he repented, he couldn't retrieve it. And it's not saying, you know, anytime we repent to God, we can, God will always, if we come and humble ourselves, he, he accepts that repentance. So it's not saying he couldn't repent to God, but it's just saying, you know, there's things in our life, once we give up, once we do these things, you can't undo it. There's damage. It, it, it can't be reversed. And Esau 
did something based in the moment that cost him his future, and that thing could not be reversed. And in light of that, we look at this passage today, and we recognize that it is telling us how to not be an Esau. You could be the most liked person in Ocala. You could have more friends than anybody around. Everybody can love you. You can do everything right. But if you are given to impulse and thinking for only the moment, it is going to cost you with God. So how do we avoid this? What are we, what are we supposed to do? How, what, what kind of things should we be focusing on rather than just the immediate? Well, we, we get five things here that it tells us we got to do. First, it tells us surprisingly we need to focus on getting along. It says strive for peace with everyone. Now, we got to say it, that story should tell us enough about the home that, that Jacob and Esau grew up in because it was a divided home because Esau was loved by his dad, but Jacob was loved by his mom. And, and so automatically, parents that have favorites, it's not going to go well in the house. And, and so this is something that, that ends up being this kind of division that's kind of swept under the rug. But, you know, you can keep some things under the rug. But what happens is those things continue to multiply. And before long, it's no longer a little bit of dirt under the rug. It's a volcano under the rug. And your rug is going to get burnt, and your house is going to come down with it. And this is exactly what happens. And so we, we got to question, and we got to say, you know, if, if Jacob and Esau would have been pressured by their parents a little more to get along, to work things out, to come together, would this have been an issue? Would this have happened? We, we don't know, but we do know this. The, the Bible tells us that it's important that we are the kind of people that do that. And, and that there is a focus, there is a, there is a part of our heart that's focused on reconciliation, getting along with the people who are around us. It, it uses that word strive. What do you think of when you think of strive? We should think of pushing for something. Push for peace with everyone. Now, does that mean everybody's going to be at peace with you if you push for peace with them? No. No. That doesn't mean that, but Paul tells us elsewhere that we are to, as much as possible, be at peace with everyone. And so we know this is, this is something that's important. Jesus told us, blessed are the, the peacemakers. And so we, we know that, that this is something that's, that's important for us, that, that we get along. And, and, and so we live in this time where this is kind of the opposite. Somewhere, you know, we've always had people who are jerks. I've, I've said my whole life, you, you don't have to look far to find a jerk, Right? There's always a jerk lurking around every corner, but, but now we live in a time there's seven or eight jerks around every corner. The corners are getting pretty crowded. We've got to swing out a little bit, and, and they're quick to jump on you, and they're quick to say things that are mean, and, and, and we deal with a lot of hostility, and, and, and we see all this, and, and so we have something in us that we like to set people straight. Don't y'all wish that? How many of y'all, some of y'all are looking like, oh, pastor, that's not me. So you've never had somebody do something mean to you and you drove off and you're going down the road going, that's what I know what I should have told them. I should have said this. That's that part I'm talking about. And, and so we have this wish that there, there could be this way that we get better at putting people in their place. And we, we get better at straightening them out, just, just letting them know the way things are. Um, how does that fit in with strive for peace with everyone? Can y'all reconcile that? You know, I, there, you know somebody's got to start being adults in this world. And if, it, if it's not the people of God, the world's in trouble. We got to lead with this thing. Because Jesus told us we got to. Hebrews tells us we have to. Paul tells us that we have to. So we better, we better get good at this. And so there needs to be this part of us. We start to, we begin to think you know, instead of how can I get even with them or how can I put them in their place, maybe we should start thinking, how can I say something that's going to put some value towards them? How can I say something that's going to encourage them? What's that? But they say, why do you have to do that? Because we're striving for peace with everyone. We don't want to be these people that are so wrapped up in the immediate. The immediate is I'm just going to set them straight. I'm going to tell them the way it is. That's an Esau decision. 
and see where it got him. But us long-term people say, God has a better way for me to be living as a believer, and my effort's going to be spent in trying to put some value in the people who are around me. And then we get to this next thing that it tells us we got to do, and that is got to focus on holiness. It says at the end of verse 14, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So we know that one's really important, right? We, we've got to, if we want to see God, we got to be holy. Now, that's easy. Part of me says, just move on to the next one, Jeff. But there's another part of me that says, if I do, we're going to be in trouble because there's a lot of debate about what holiness is. And see, we, at one point, trying to understand holiness, we begin to define it by all the things that we do not do. And we had, boy, we had a really wonderful list that not making anybody uncomfortable, but just looking around here today, you guys wouldn't make the holiness test 30, 40 years ago. There's not many of us that would have been able to survive it. The fact I'm not wearing a suit or a tie right now means I wouldn't make the holiness test of 40 years ago. There's people that would have wrote Ichabod on the door. The spirit has departed from Ocala First Assembly because pastors have to dress a certain way. And there's people they got to, women can't be wearing jewelry and they shouldn't be wearing makeup. And, and we might even preach a sermon against makeup because we were really holy. And, and there's all these, these rules for what you got to wear and what you got to do. And, and, you know, what we ended up doing, we, it, the people that were into that meant well. They wanted, they wanted to please God. But sometimes if you're going a human way to do a God thing, you're going to end up on the wrong track. And, and what we ended up doing is producing people who could live the list, but they became so full of pride, they became vicious gossips against anybody who didn't fit into the list and couldn't live it. And we discovered, as we begin to read the Bible, these holy people were producing, as we defined holiness, were just like another group of people in the Bible that we don't want to be anything like. They were called Pharisees. They crucified Jesus because he didn't fit their list. And so we realized, okay, maybe we need to redefine holiness. Maybe it's time. And, and so we begin to look at it again, and we realize that holiness, when it's mentioned in the Bible, it's talking about something that the Holy Spirit is producing on our inside, not what we're looking like on the outside. And, and we begin to realize, you know, we, we, we said, what made Jesus so special? Well, somebody, it's a legalist definition of holiness. They say, well, I'll tell you what made Jesus special. He didn't go to movies and he didn't wear shorts. That's why, that's why sanctuaries are built all over the world and people are ready to die for him because he didn't do those things. We understand there's a problem with that definition, don't we? Maybe why we love Jesus so much is because he was full of love. Amen. Maybe, maybe it's because of the joy of Christ that we follow him, the peace that he gives us. See, these, the holiness in our life, is, these things are being produced by the Holy Spirit. And, and so as the writer of Hebrews is saying this, he's saying, strive for holiness to, to be the person that Christ has created you to be that, that's in his image. Paul's talking to the people in Athens in, in the book of Acts, and, and he tries to describe to them uh, God and what God's like. He says, for, and, and Christ, and he says, for in him we live and move and have our being. That's somebody that's on a path of holiness. In him I live and move and have my being. I know the joy of the Lord. I'm trying to be like Jesus. I'm trying to follow him. I want to show what Christ showed to this world. See, this puts us on this path of holiness. It takes us off this, this path of, a, of immediacy. I got, immediacy says, I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm going to do what I want to do. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's kind of, a lot of people are saying those kind of things. Well, I hear Christians say that all the time. Do you know, holiness calls us to look beyond that and begin to look at the life that's going to reflect Christ. And this brings us to the third thing, and it says, it's focus on others, where it says, see to it, that no one fall, fails to obtain the grace of God. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. Now, we know grace is what makes it possible for us to be saved because none of us are, are good enough to get what Christ did on the cross for us. I mean, we've all messed up. We've all done things. 
but yet Christ gives it to us anyway, even though we don't deserve it. That's grace. And let's, let's admit it, even though that we get saved by grace, you know, there's still some jerky things to every one of us, right? And you know, maybe we can't think of us, but we certainly know that's true for a lot of other people around us, right? And that's just here Ocala first, but people go to other churches. Man, it's really bad for them, but, you know, we're close. But, you know, it's, but it's by grace that we continue to live. But, you know, there's, there's this temptation of grace, and, and I've heard this, there's been this emphasis on, on grace teaching that's, that's come up in the last few years, and it seems like it's starting to fade a little bit in the church, but, but the emphasis was is that, that grace is so great and so wonderful, you can do whatever you want, and you're covered. And, and we see that, that this is telling us that it's possible that people can fail to obtain the grace of God. Paul even talks, and he, he writes, and he says, see that you don't receive the grace of God in vain. What's this mean? It means that it's possible that we can decide, I'm just going to keep living in sins, and God's going to have to take me as I am because I'm covered by grace. That, that's not what that's saying. We all want to live a holy life. And so we're trying to, to live in holiness, to be like Christ. And we want to make sure that we don't abuse the grace of God. But this says something else. It says, see to it that no one fails. And so we're to watch out for other people. And, you know, I started to think about this because we're living in, you know, it's always been like this, but it, it's especially true now. People want to be mad. They want to, they want to be angry at people. And, and so one of the things that we see in our society that's, that's in big trouble right now is humor. People say things as a joke, and people are wanting to be mad. They just get it. They don't, they don't care that it's a joke. You said it, therefore I've taken it this way, and that's the only way it can be. And, and they're ready to go out, and, you know, and so we're, we're ready to take offense. And so I'm saying what I'm getting ready to say, realizing that we live in a world that all people want is for you to try to say something to encourage them to live for God, and they're going to take offense at it and talk about how they've been wounded by the church. It's, it's our time. But here's what the Bible says. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. We're under an obligation to try to make sure there's people that are driving over the cliff of sin. And we're supposed to, in, in the mind of the world today, we're supposed to say, look at them go, how fast they're going. They are going right over the cliff of sin. They are gonna, they're going to fly 40 feet across before their car ever crashes. That's not what we're to do. We've got to be concerned for people. And so I think it's we got to be careful what this is going to look like. And I was thinking, well, what, what can I tell you guys that this is supposed to look like? And, and just know there's always people who are going to take offense. We've got to be careful with what we're saying. But at the same time, we're required to say something. And I, I give you guys my CrossFit stories. And so, uh, you know, I, I go and I work out at CrossFit. And, and you know, I've, I've never really been athletic. So this is kind of new stuff for me. And I've been doing this for a couple of years. And I've still got a long way to go to be like a lot of the people that I work out with. I mean, they're just machines. And it's just, it's, it's just crazy to watch them. And, and, but we'll do these things where we're doing these, these workouts that are really kind of long and complex. And, and honestly, I'm in the middle. You're lifting weights. You're running a half mile. And then you go and you're doing all these like pull-ups and or push-ups and then you run another half mile and it just you know you, you keep going and it's it's just real intense and really difficult and and some of them they do so well and and I can get through it but it ain't going to be pretty and sometimes I can't get through it but sometimes I'll be at the end and they're you know a lot of them have finished they're real athletic they've been doing this forever and 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 they you know they're done before me and I'm thinking, you know, I think I've done enough of this. I don't want to die here today. I don't want the church to hear pastor didn't make it through Tuesday CrossFit session. I want y'all to think better, remember better things for me. And I think I'm just going to let, and what happens? Here they're standing around me, cheering me on. I want to say right now for you guys, I hate that. I don't want to be noticed when I'm pouring sweat and I look like I'm going to die, one of them even put, videoed me, showing me how the fighter spirit that Jeff had to get through it, and they put it on our page. I was so humiliated. It's the worst picture of me ever. I don't want that. 
But you know what happens when they do that? I get through it. I push because I don't want them to see me quit. I want them to. I want them to know that Jeff. I don't want y'all to. Have, uh, they're like, oh, you pat. You go to the church where Jeff Wade pastors. Yeah, I work out with them. I feel bad for you. I can only imagine he can't finish a workout. What's that church guy? I want you guys to think good of me. And so, it works because they encourage me. And so I'm saying all this to say this. I think that what we got to realize is is that you know we all need to be encouraged to make it. We don't need to be discouraged. You know, if they stood around me and they were going, Jeff, if you lost 25 more pounds, this wouldn't be so hard on you. <laughs> Jeff, you look like, you know, you, you need to be improving that diet. Are you eating pizza? <laughs> Jeff, you've been doing this two years and you're still struggling to make that much weight? Jeff, you need to be more at it like, you know, they're not, they're not telling me everything I'm doing wrong. They're telling me I can make it doing right. And see, this is what we've got to be thinking of. We're we're not here to set everybody straight because they may may do something terrible and start trying to set us straight. We don't want that. But we want to be encouragers. We want to tell them they can do it because they can. And we want them to have a sense that, that we stand with them. We don't ever want anybody to think nobody cares about me in the church. It don't matter that my life's falling apart. Nobody will say anything. And the truth is, we're scared to death they're going to take offense and they're going to all be mad. Well, you know what? If you're trying to encourage somebody and they get mad about that, that's on them. That's not on you. And so we want to make sure we're focused on others and not just on ourselves so we can avoid being like an Esau. And we want to focus on gratefulness. You know, it says in, 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 at the end of verse 15 that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. You know, there's always people that will offend you. There's always people that will do you wrong. There's always ways you're going to get hurt. There's always things that's going to, that's going to strike you wrong. And it's easy to let those things just set in our soul and they just kind of ruminate, and they just start to get worse and worse, and they just kind of, it just kind of just builds up, and, and we just kind of, it just, and what ends up happening, the Bible says here, we grow a root of bitterness in our heart. We, we decide that, that this is something that, that is just so, we've been done so wrong, and we've been hurt so bad, and and oh, I'm so angry, and oh, I'm so mad, and, and, and we begin to tell other people about it, and before long, people come over, and we want them on our side, and so other people become part of this, and there's divisions that start to form, and, and we become defiled, and, and you know, what, what this is telling us is, we got to watch out for bitterness. We got to watch out for these things that we're holding against other people, you know. We could say, well, how important is that to our Christianity? I got to tell you guys, I there's so much I could say about political situation in our country. And I know I say a lot because a lot needs to be said from the pulpit, not what other parties are staying and doing. God hasn't called me to be Fox News or CNN News. He's called me to preach the Word of God. So we're going to focus on the Word of God. And what I'm going to tell you from the Word of God is this. Some of us have got so bitter at politics in our country and at other political parties that we're not a part of. All we talk about is that. That's all that upsets us. We're, we're laying in bed. We're telling everybody how mad we are all the time, how upset we are all the time. We've got a root of bitterness, and we're never mentioning Jesus. I want to challenge you to just start in your mind, think, in this conversation I just had with this person, how much did I talk about what God's done for me, and how much did I talk about Joe Biden or Donald Trump? Because some, without knowing it, Our Savior has become politicians and not the one who died on the cross for us. And we have got to get to a place because there is a root. See, we're focusing on this immediate and not on the long term. See, when I get to heaven and I stand before the throne, this is going to be disappointing for some of y'all, but it's not going to be Donald Trump sitting on the throne saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. And it's certainly not going to be Joe Biden sitting on the throne saying, well done, good and faithful servant. It's not going to be Nancy Pelosi. I can, boy, I'm, this is going to be, I'm getting the best responses of this sermon right now. All I got to do is just say politicians. 
Chuck Schumer. I can just keep whipping out those names. Mitch McConnell. No. Okay. See, I think the devil's, you know, we live in, here in the United States of America. We got to be part of this system. We don't hide from it. But it is not our Savior. It is not ultimately what we are about. We are about the one who died on that cross for us. That is our home. That is our residence. We're going to be great citizens of this country. But when it comes down to it, we're about Jesus. We don't live for the immediate. We got our minds focused on the long term. Amen. Amen. And we get this, and we make that our heart, and this gets us to the fifth one. We focus on purity, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy. Boy, I can, there's so much I can say on this. I, I, I'm just going to say on this, we know, we, there's so much perversion out there. We can't keep track of all the perversion. There's, there's things that now that's going on in our world that I didn't even know existed five years ago. And I'm proud I didn't know they existed. Some of them I don't think did exist five years ago. But we're on such a course of perversion right now that we're inventing new stuff that's messed up. But you know, God's plan still is what it says in, in, in the book of Genesis. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You know, that's still, that's God's plan still. And, and sex is not meant to be something dirty or nasty, but something that God's given to bless us. And we've always, it just you can read in the Old Testament, they had cult prostitutes, they had all this stuff that was going on in the Old Testament, and, and God's way seemed outdated and too strict back then, thousands of years ago. And what are people telling us now? Oh, that's so outdated and that's so strict. It's the same thing, they've been saying it for thousands of years about God's way. But all I'll tell you is this, the Bible talks about the book of Judges, and it says that the people of that time did what seemed right in their own eyes. And if you want to know what chaos looks like when people bypass God's plan and do things their own way and how ugly that chaos can be, read the book of Judges. I don't want to live in that kind of world. I want to live in a world where people are living without regret, that people are being faithful to one another, that homes are solid, that love prevails, and that God's way wins. And the only way that's going to happen is by focusing on purity. And this brings us to these two verses that we finished with last week. We were talking about the discipline of God that's meant to bring us to a place of strength last week. And now those two verses, they were the end of what we were looking at, and they're the beginning of what we start out with this week. And what they're telling us in light of this week and what we're talking about, therefore lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet. It's saying, quit having crawling along, barely making it Christianity. That's, that's Esau Christianity. That's Esau faith. You know, he, he, he was a good guy. But he cared more about what's right now than what God had for him in living a righteous life. Quit crawling along. Believe God's got something better. Believe that, that what's lame in our faith, that God can make strong. You know, this is talking about spiritual healing here at the end of this. Physical healing, there can be a lot of components to it. You need people praying for you, and, and there's medicine a lot of times. There's work of doctors. There may be surgery. All this stuff required in physical healing, and, and you know, it's... It, it, it just takes a lot of factors sometimes for a physical healing. But spiritual healing, it's just a matter of us saying, I'm tired of how I've been living spiritually. I want something better. I want it to be what God's calling me to. And this is what this is telling us. Get up. Get moving. Live for God. Get tired of being Esau. You can still be a nice, good person like Esau, but you don't have to live in the blunder of living for the moment. Start living for the long term that God wants you to focus on. The race that's before you. The prize that awaits because you've lived a life of faithfulness. It's a call to every one of us. And it's something that every single one of us can do if we get our eyes on him. Will you bow your heads with me across this building? And as you're bowing your heads, a question that I got to ask, and I know there's people on live stream, I just want to encourage you if you're at home, just bow your heads with us just for a moment. 
And we ask this every week because this is the most important thing. You've got to make a start with God. Have you made a start with God? Are you, are you living for Jesus Christ? Or have you been going your own way, doing things your own way? You've been living for your moment, but you haven't been living for what God ultimately has for you. Is there anybody here that just lift their hand and say, Pastor, I'm not a Christian today, but I want to start living for Jesus. I want to start, I want to begin to be the person God's calling me to be. Is there anybody here this morning? Just lift their hand. Maybe you're at home this morning on live stream and you just want lifting your hand at home or maybe you're in the car. You can just kind of, if you're driving down the road, you can put one hand on the wheel and lift your other hand just for a moment. It's not important. It's so much that you lift your hand. It's just that you're saying, I'm making a change. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start living for Jesus. I'm not going to be living the way that I've been, but I'm going to start living the life that he has for me. If you lifted your hand this morning, we're going to pray. Those of you watching on live stream, lifted your hand. Even if you didn't, but you want to you be a follower of Christ, if you will pray with us, repeat this prayer. This will be your start in following Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I've made mistakes. I've done things wrong. Forgive me for every single one of them. I want to live better. I want to follow you. Thank you for forgiving me and for giving me this new start. In your name, Jesus, amen.